YouTube found a community, ESQ fans, random people on the internet. My name is Giggins. We are joined today by David Beard, the guy who runs ESQ and this summer quarterly, the Beach Boys magazine, one of the coolest things on the internet about the Beach Boys and in real life because you can hold it. Um, hey, David, how's it going? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's really fun to be able to talk about this magazine because I remember when I first heard about it, it felt like this thing where I was like, what is this? magical mystery magazine that i i don't know too much about but once i signed up for it and got into it i fell in love with it i've been a subscriber for years now it's been something that's been absolutely pivotal to have as a beach boys fan because you get all this great insight you get all this detail and I've, I've been studying these guys for 25 years now and there's always new stuff for me to be like oh didn't know that before so i mean it's been around for a long time how did you get involved with it and what's your story like of getting into the magazine <laughs> Well, I got lucky because I met Lee Dempsey. Um, I think I, well, it goes as far back to sometime in 79 or 80, I saw the Jan and Dean television movie, Dead Man's Curve. And because of the exposure of that film, and, I, and Mike, Mike and Bruce make cameos in it, Dick Clark makes a cameo in it. Um, I was just fascinated by that music, that early sound and and my favorite scene i'm going to diverge for a minute my favorite scene in that tv film was when the actors as jan and dean are standing uh at the ocean as the water's coming in they have surfboards and richard hatch who played jan says to bruce davidson who played dean oh this would sound so great on tape and he goes what I said this it would sound so great on tape and he goes what like what are you talking about? what would sound great he's referring to the surf <laughs> and they cut they cut directly to them singing surfing in the studio as Jan and Dean cutting it. And it's just like my favorite moment in that show, in that TV movie. And I didn't know, oh, that's the Beach Boys or anything like that back then. I just thought, oh, I love that. I just, that was like my galvanizing moment. And then I went out and in those days you could go to used record stores or even record stores uh, that were new and upcoming because 7980, you know, very popular. It was very easy to go to a retail record store. Yeah. And I went and I bought Jan and Dean's two record set um, anthology album, which was three sides of all this, all the hits that you would know by them, plus some um, cuts that maybe you're not quite as familiar by them. And then the fourth side is just this weird hodgepodge of machine guns and cows mooing and burps. Uh, and car crashes, which which they did on um, Dead Man's Curve, but it was just all kind of this weird montage of sound effects while they were performing songs. And I just thought, what in the world? And I was maybe 13 or 14 years old, and I just loved it all. Yeah. So I, but the, two, the, the, the point of the anthology album was when I opened it and had this book, uh, booklet inside, that was written by Dave Marsh from Cream Magazine. And Dave Marsh wrote this really great piece about who Jan and Dean were and their their importance as it related to that that culture of that era of music. And then I got to the back and I was reading about the Beach Boys and who Brian Wilson was. And, and again, just keeping in mind the, the frame of reference here, no Google, no Internet, no you, just what you got in front of you. And if you happen to have a book, all the better. Right. But that that was it. So that was my introduction into the whole the genre, the whole experience was that anthology album. I think by that time I had the best of the Beach Boys, the first one, mm -hmm. because I belonged to a uh, Columbia or RCA record club. And, and back in those days, you had like a dime or a penny or whatever it was, and you would give them a, a penny and you'd get 10 albums for a penny or a some thing. ludicrous <laughs> thing. A weird scheme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how they managed that, I, but I... Yeah. <laughs> to this day, I don't know how they managed it, but they did it. And um, I can't remember all the stuff I got, but, but I know I got Best of the Beach Boys. So I knew some of their songs. I knew then I got this Jan and Dean anthology. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. So they're talking about Brian Wilson and then all the song credits. And I'm reading, okay, he wrote this song with Surf City. He 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 sings backgrounds on this, you know, Honolulu Lulu. And so it's going through there and seeing Drag City. And I'm going, oh my gosh, I want to know more about the Beach Boys. Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. So, but it's still at the same time, even though I had the record and I'm seeing Surfing as written by Brian Wilson and Mike Love, it's still not dawning on me 
that that song wasn't written for Jan and Dean. That that can that you know how this happened and why it happened and when it happened yeah. was still not clear to me. So then uh, from there, I remember buying Pet Sounds on vinyl mm -hmm. because it was a Beach Boys record. And so now we're getting into the early to mid eighties and uh, I didn't really get pet sounds. I, I remember listening to it all the way through. And to best of my memory, the song that stood out to me the most that I really, really liked was that's not me. And I don't know why. Interesting. I, I, maybe, maybe it reminded me of the type of melodies and things that I'd heard on Best of the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. And by this time, I know I also had, I believe, a cassette of Endless Summer. Cool. So I had some stuff, but Endless Summer, as you know, didn't have like their greatest, like Good Vibrations wasn't even on that for some odd reason. Yeah. Best of the Beach Boys didn't have all their number one hits on it for some right. odd reason. Right. Weird. <laughs> it's uh, So um, didn't have Best of the Beach Boys 2, didn't have Best of the Beach Boys 3. I think at some point I got Best of the Beach Boys 2. But again, Long Tall Texan? what so I mean, anyway frosted the snowman on the third one so <laughs> so it, it it was it was it, it you know and what got me into oldies what made me even interested in the jan and dean tv movie when it came on was kiss when i lived in new york um i had in 1978 kiss released um i think it was 78 or 79 their kiss alive 2 album yeah and that was a two record set and that was three sides, like the anthology album. It was three sides of uh, live album. It was the opposite of the Jan and Dean thing. So it was three sides of live. And then the fourth side was all these B-sides and leftover cuts that didn't make any, any Kiss album. And there was a couple of covers. And one of the covers that that was just, just, just took me away was Paul Stanley singing the Dave Clark Fives, Any Way You Want It. Love that version. And I remember walking down the halls of junior high school singing what I thought was a Kiss song. <laughs> Any way I want it. Hey, hey, hey. It's all right. You know, that's, that's it what worked. I was It sounds like that, you're right. <laughs> that, that, yeah. It drove me to, I didn't know at the time, but that's what introduced me to oldies music. Yeah. And so then once I'm down in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, which is where I'm now, um, we moved in January 79. I end up watching Dead Man's Curve. I'm, all of a sudden, you know, very interested in Jan and Dean, the two record set, which I could not have asked to buy a better first Jan and Dean record because it told me so much that led to my interest in the Beach Boys. Yep. And then when that happened, uh, it, again, I listened to Pet Sounds, probably listened to it once. And I remember liking That's Not Me. And then, and by that time I had heard Keeping the Summer Alive, Oh, yeah. Because we're in the early, early 80s. And so I was very aware of the Beach Boys. You know, I was by that time paying attention to the Beach Boys. And I went to broadcast school in August of 85. Um, and by that time, the 85 album had come out. And I have to tell you, I listened. I ruined that cassette. <laughs> That's that. That was the music. What I would, for whatever reason, maybe because it was like "Get You Back" was like those early songs. Absolutely. You know, it, had, it has a bit of a "Don't Worry, Baby" and a, and a um, the nostalgic feel another song it reminds me of. But it's a, definitely a "Don't Worry, Baby" uh, vibe to it. But yep. it's the it's the soaring falsetto with the "Ow, bow, bow." You know, it's everything. It's the doo wop sound. It's the it's the falsetto that the Beach Boys were noted for. Yep. And it, it sucked me right in. And I enjoyed that album immensely. I, I remember driving to one radio job to another, singing with that in the car, jammed in my cassette player, singing along and just couldn't get enough of it. Great album. And I still love, I still love the album to this day. Oh yeah. Um, so that that was one of the and 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 oh, and by that time also. I'm forgetting because I started as a Jan and Dean fan. I had the Mike and Dean rock and roll city cassette. I yeah. had everything that was Radio Shack was putting out. I had it because they also, there was also another cassette that was, um, that was also vinyl. That was Jan and Dean and the beach boys on one LP. Yeah. Right. And, and that was cool. I really liked that. I remember really liking that. 
And so that that was kind of like the timing of when I came into that music. The oh, and the fact that my minister, my youth minister at my church, my youth group, he was a major Beach Boys fan, but he liked like the L.A. album and he had um, the 10 Years of Harmony collection. Love that album. So I'm I'm this newbie fan who's into the and this is before the 80s, this is before I went off to radio and all that. This is like early 80s in the youth group. And he's he's playing this stuff that I'm not really. <laughs> I'm like, OK, that's interesting that that's the same group. But I like this other stuff from like Endless Summer. That's the stuff that I'm into right now. Right. Like, give me Catch a Wave. Give me 409, Shut Down, Little Deuce Coop. That's, yeah. that's what I was, because that's what Jan and Dean were like, right? Because Jan and Dean stopped. So Jan and Dean were kind of stuck in that bubble. And um, so that's that's kind of what my introduction to the Beach Boys was. And so by the time... I was then working in radio, you know, kind of full time. By the time like the 89 album came out, still cruising, I remember vividly thinking to myself, this is the best thing they've done in, in not not the song still cruising, but somewhere near Japan, That's a great an song. island girl yeah. like in my car. Make it big. I, yeah. I was thinking, man, I was just like, this is the best stuff these guys have done in decades. Yeah, it's an underrated and that's, album. And, and it was weird because they 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 butchered the album because they went and <laughs> stuck the the wrong mix of "Wouldn't It Be Nice" on the back, mm -hmm. and and they they just shoved old songs on the end of it as opposed to waiting maybe a year, you know. And 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 I get now that I look back at it, I understand what they did is because they didn't have the rights to get say, uh, "It's a Beautiful Day," and in "Chasing the Sky," "It's a Beautiful Day." um and that's too bad because that's that's what would have to me made made that and then and then you had uh in 1990 although it's not some speller song they had problem child yeah and that 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 to me would have been the three cuts you put on the end of that because that's makes sense those are then, then it is a soundtrack album it would have worked. Or, or you can at least pretend that it is you know so, yeah. uh, you know with newer material so I think, you know, that's, that happens a lot in the Beach Boys history, you know, by one year, if you had waited, I mean, look at the Friends <laughs> album, right? The yeah. Friends album comes out and less than a month later, they have a number one hit with Do It Again. Yeah. Two weeks after I mean, the album came out. Had I mean, Do yeah. It Again been on Friends, what would we be talking about? I mean, that's, it's, it's just, so that, that kind of happened to them a lot. And Bruce, Bruce has told me, he said, can you imagine if Good Vibrations, he said, what was it? Oh gosh! Um, oh, Sloop John B had been on Summer Days, uh huh. Possible. And then Good Vibrations would have been on Pet Sounds. He said we'd be on another stratosphere. None of us would be talking to you because we'd be even more popular than we are. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, so you know, it's interesting. And if you ask Al, Al will tell you that Good, he, in his opinion, he thought Good Vibrations was done in time for Pet Sounds. So, you know, it's just, it's just. Uh, it's it's very interesting, and I, I I think I really just fell in love. I really fell in love with the Beach Boys with the '85 album. Yeah, not because, not because I thought it was better than their early music. It it was never anything like that. It was yeah. just it was an album that was released in my time of loving them, and becoming aware of them, and it was really. I thought very good. And I was a fan of Culture Club. I liked Culture Club music. So again, I didn't know, oh, this guy is this guy. I didn't know. Levine, yeah, right. None right. of that. It wasn't, oh, Steve Levine, Steve Levine. It was not right. that. It was, I liked the music that Culture Club had success with that was on the radio. Mm -hmm. So when this album came out, I, I guess now looking back, I can say, oh, that's probably part of the reason is because Steve Levine knew what he was doing. The magic but, touch. Yeah. Yeah. Back back in the, that, at that point, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't put that together. I just went, I really like this. This is, yeah. this is catchy. And then they went and had success with it on a radio. Yeah. Right. So it speaks to, and then, oh my God, a year later in 86, they become really relevant. And this is, this is another, this is, you're getting me off on these tangents because this is what <laughs> happens with me when I talk, talk Beach Boys. So 86, they have Made in USA mm -hmm. and they have this incredible black and white California Dreamin' video. Yeah. With Mama and the Papa and, and Roger McGuinn, right? It's this incredible, like, oh, my God, they're relevant. Look, at they just did the 85 album. Look at this. 
and then rock and roll to the rescue, which is just balls out fun. Yep. And it's just like, this is too cool. This is exactly who the Beach Boys are. This is what we want. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And then they follow that up with happy endings from the movie, The Telephone. And they follow that up with Wipeout. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, what? You just went from cool and relevant again <clears throat> after a very long period. Even, even if you look at Keeping the Summer Alive or the L.A. album or M.I.U., it had been a long time since I think the general public thought of the Beach Boys as a relevant act. Absolutely. And I thought the 85 album, followed up by the greatest hits with California Dreamin' and Rock and Roll the Rescue, galvanized oh. that 80 audience and made them relevant again and had, and had nothing come out in 87. Yeah. They would have been fine because they followed it up with Kokomo. It would have been a yeah right. right. So if right. you get, if you get rid of happy endings, which is actually a nice song, yeah, it's nice. Carl sounds great. It, it's, it's a nice song, but wipeout was just so unnecessary. But I get what they're doing. They're yeah. they're 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 trying to cross market. It was the same thing they did in '96 with their country album. They're they're trying to reach different audiences, and I get it. But no thanks. I <laughs> I'm. I'm sorry. I watched the video once and said, Carl's not in it. That's all I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so they put him on the beach guys. ball. Yeah. Wasn't his face like on a beach ball behind yeah. Brian? Yeah. Some, some really tacky. Well, there's Carl. <laughs> there he is. They're all here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're all here. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how I fell in love with them. And then so I actually, I went to my junior prom this gets back to your original question. I went to my junior prom with a, with a wonderful girl. She went to a different high school. Uh, it's just through our church that I knew her. And then a uh, senior prom came. She had had a boyfriend by that point. And I asked two, maybe three girls. And like each of them had a date already. And I was like, I'm not going to. I'm good. <laughs> and I'm not going to go by myself. That's not my scene. Yeah. And so my dad said, well, we have this money that we were going to give you for prom. You can do with it whatever you want. I said, okay, I'm going to go to a record convention. And that's what I did. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he went with me and it was cool. You know, I was collecting Jan and Dean at that time. I was trying to find out all the dirt. And again, I didn't have Google to look up what's all the stuff no. there. You had, you could buy like a price guide, you know, like a physical price guide book and hope you find what you're looking for in there to A, see what it's worth and B, what exists. Yeah, you you know, know, that, that was the... Yeah. So uh, went to, I, I, I stocked up on my collectible Jan and Dean stuff, but sporadically Beach Boy stuff. I was well aware of Smile, and yeah. that really drove my interest to the Beach Boys because I'm thinking, how is this group, the California Dream and the Rock and Roll of the Rescue, the Get You Back, how is that group the same group who did a song called Do You Like Worms? How, how is that the same? That. Yeah. That's what really intrigued me. Yeah. And I fell in love with Smile um, the second I started understanding it. And again, and, but that was because in 85, we had an American band come out, mm -hmm. right? The documentary. And yeah. that's, even though, again, at that time, I didn't, the footage of Brian wearing the fire hat, they put it with the fire music. I didn't realize, oh, that's actually good vibrations. It, it didn't matter. I thought that was kind of clever that oh, they cool. put it together that yeah. way. Right. Because it sold me. Yep. You know, it was like, OK, what is this? I was say, and yeah. How was the guy who did. Wouldn't it be nice? The guy wearing a fire hat, clearly tripping. Yeah, you could see it on camera. He's going, yeah. <laughs> you know, how is that guy, that guy? And how long was the stretch of time between this event and this event? Yep. And how did that happen? So that's what drove my interest. And I got I think one of the first books I got was Dominic Priori's. Uh, Dumb Angel Gazette, Look, Listen, yeah. Vibrate, Smile. Yep. I had that. At some point, I got David Leaf's first volume. And then, and so I started going to record conventions as kind of a consistency to fulfill my Jan and Dean collection and to kind of start getting into the Beach Boys. And all I would do when I'd go to a record convention as it relates to the Beach Boys is try to find Smile bootlegs. Oh, yeah. And I found some. I found some great Smile vinyl bootlegs. And... I was just eating it up. So I, I was going to record conventions and then there was one uh, between Charlotte and Raleigh. I can't quite remember the name of the place, but it was in a uh, barn, like a red barn. It was right off the exit. 
And that's the same one I went to with my dad when I was a senior. It's the same one. And I and I got off the exit. I, I went in and I was very impatiently waiting behind this guy who was standing at the Beach Boy section. I mean, every dealer has their own Beach Boy and Jan and Dean, right? But I'm trying to find the best one who's got the best of what I'm looking for. And I got behind this guy who's just kind of taking his time, one album at a time. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> get out of the way, get out of the way. Yeah, come on, man. Yeah. And uh, so he eventually moved and I started and we started talking and that was Lee Dempsey. And um, like three weeks later, it was a short time later, could have been a week, three weeks. I don't remember the window of time, but he lived in Raleigh at the time. And we talked and I told him all about my interest in Smile. So this was, this was the late eighties, I would around 88, 89. And uh, uh, so he, we met each other, we, we, we were both at another record convention within a short time. And he said, hey, so we got talking and so I were looking through records and then he said, hey, come on out to my car. I wanna play something for you. I went out, sat in this passenger seat and he popped in a cassette and he started playing all this stuff. One cut after another cut after another cut after another cut of smile sessions. Cool. And I my I was just like <laughs> I kind because this was not out there anywhere. No, no one and he pushed yeah. he pushed eject on a cassette, he took it out, he put it in the cassette case, and then everything was written down and he handed it to me and he said, That's for you. So that's how I met, you know, that's how my friendship with, with Lee Dempsey has, has been uh, Game kind changer. of an integral part of my, of my, the EXQ experience because at that time by the late eighties, Lee was already writing for endless summer quarterly because it was founded on the West coast in San Diego. Right. And it was run by Phil Mast and Rick Edgel. And Lee told me about the magazine as we were getting to know each other more. I can't recall right he moved to, but he moved to his job brought him to Charlotte by 1990 ish. Mm -hmm. um, and he told me about ESQ and he said, you ought to subscribe. I write, I write in it. And I said, okay, cool. So I subscribed for one year and I, I believe it was 1990. And at that time, the magazine was, and keeping in mind that at that technology, speaking technology, you know, from a technical standpoint, magazines were had to be put together differently back then. Yeah. And you couldn't do it all on your computer and then send it in like you can now. Um, so I don't know how they did it, but it, it was mostly, from my memory, it was mostly pictures of the guys who did the magazine with their arms around the Beach Boys or pictures of sheet music. And there, and uh, Les Chan, uh, God rest his soul, um, was a major Uber fan. He wrote for the he would write the news section and I like that. But if the news section wasn't long, then it wasn't much, you know. It, and again, we didn't have Google back then, so news in a in a magazine was very okay. very critical. Right, right. And then whatever Lee wrote. So, but if Lee didn't write for all four issues, then it kind of let me feeling he left me feeling like I'm not really getting information. I'm not other than the news section. I don't feel like I'm learning anything. Sure. And I, I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could, particularly about Smile. And um, so I stopped subscribing to ESQ uh, after one year. I didn't re I didn't renew. I didn't I didn't feel anything. I wasn't getting anything out of it. Right. Now, I don't know if that's it. I don't know if that's really true or fair. It just wasn't. I Again, I was hungry for Smile. That, yeah. That's all I cared about. I didn't care about anything else. That's all I wanted to know about. Yeah. And um, so that's what drove me. So then Lee had moved here and then we hung out for a couple of years. We even did some fun songs together as Will Bryson and the Shocking Shrinks. Um, and there's another one we did is Bloody, the, the, the Bloody Moose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one was called, one was called, uh, if you've ever heard Landy, Landy, he needs me. Oh yeah. Uh, have you heard that by Will Bryson? I've heard of it. I've never heard it before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I might have to get that to you. <laughs> I I know a guy. Um, I hope he doesn't get mad that I'm like telling people who he. I mean, I think it's known by now. Statute of limitations, oh, I guess. But, yeah. Um, but so he was just fun. I was in radio. He was doing his regular job, and we would get together when we could. We were both single guys at the time. Um. And we just would have fun. And uh, 
Then in the summer of 93, and I don't remember which month, but he called me. And then we talked about, he said that the guys in, the, in San Diego weren't going to do ESQ anymore. They were burnt out. Uh, they had just over a couple couple hundred subscribers. And um, did I want to do it with him? And he said, I have to buy a business license and set up a P.O. box and all that. And I said, sure, if, if you want to do that, I would love to. Oh, sure, I would love to write about the Beach Boys. Because I was just, again, I was just getting into this stuff and really... Hungry just and, yeah, I was just all on board. I, yeah. you know, I didn't know what I would be writing about, but I just was sure, like, sure. Yeah. And um, he uh, he then he then he cautioned me because they had told him this. Rick and Phil had told Lee, do not expect access to the Beach Boys. Do not expect anything. You buying the business license does not mean anything. Yeah. Right. Right. So we were told that we were told don't don't expect anything. Don't you know, you can't. And we said, okay, all right. <laughs> and uh, so we, going in, when we took over the magazine, or when Lee took it over and I joined him, uh, there was no, there was no, there was no, oh, I'm going to get to meet anybody or anything like that. It was just, we're doing this because we love this music. Right. And um, my first interview that I got to do, phone interview, was set up by Elliot Kendall. Um, he's a great guy. Um, and he set me an interview up with Dean Torrance. And I remember being, and I did it from the radio station I was working at. And I, I remember being so nervous, like, you know, I, 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 you know, the whole <laughs> way through it. And I just kept thinking, what's wrong with me? Why am I, why am I so nervous? But because I was talking to like Dean Torrance or Janet Dean, you know, I couldn't believe yeah. that the guy from Dead Man's Curve all that stuff, all this, you know, all him. these records I collected, this is the guy. <laughs> right. And yeah. he was, you, I think he was kind of tickled by all the stuff I knew by that point. I was asking him about their unreleased TV pilot. I was asking, you know, and he was like, well, who, you know, who's this guy? <laughs> so um, he was very nice. And I think that kind of made it easier for me to kind of get into doing the magazine. Right. That I got lucky that my first interview was such a gracious... Uh, he is he is as he is now as he was then. If you've ever seen any video interviews with him, yeah, uh, he's just a very nice guy. He's a great storyteller. Spins the yarn like no one's business, <laughs> um, and he he was just very very cool. And um, and so not you know fast forward a year or two or so, uh, you know I'm I'm married by ninety four. My first marriage. Um, I'm doing more and more interviews. We get to meet the Beach Boys backstage. We interact with them pretty well. I get to meet Carl Wilson. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you my first impression of him. We there was like a group of us um backstage at Carowinds, which is an amusement park here, kind of like a small town Disney World, but it's the big area for, for this area, it's the big place, it's the amusement park to go. Right, right. And we were backstage and they had a piano. And it was kind of a not a very big room, but we we is we were kind of everybody was kind of clustered because the Beach Boys weren't there yet. So we're what do we do? What do we do? Yeah. Um, and then they started coming in one by one. And I'm like this. I'm like, oh, this is just too cool. This yeah, is amazing. Absolutely. And I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. But we we as this group of people and I, I'm guessing there's roughly 20 of us. We kind of horseshoe, so we we divide so that it's easy for the guys to come around and say hello to us. So right next to the piano, as soon as you walk in the room, one part of the room. Now Lee and I were at the tail end of it, which I recommend to anyone watching this. If you ever get to go backstage and meet, and you're in a group of people, be at the end of the line. Even if you're getting your photo, no matter what the circle, if you have something to sign, be at the end of the line, because you're at the front of the line. They will herd you through quicker than cattle. Get at the end of the line. Right. Do yourself a favor. You'll get five <laughs> extra seconds that the other person before you did not get. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's important <laughs> to know that. So uh, Carl took the time to start with the people across from us. One by one, Giggins, he goes around, hi, I'm Carl Wilson. Hi, I'm Carl Wilson. That's so cool. Hi. 
I'm Carl Wilson. And it's like, of course you're Carl Wilson. We do we we know who you are. You know. <laughs> but 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 he still did that. He was he was just so and he even recognized the guy who eventually became my friend, Tom Martin. Um, Tom was there and he stopped for a brief moment, did a step with them, asked how they were. Uh, he because his wife was with him and he talked to them for you know a little bit of extra time. Uh, and he came around to us and I asked him, I, I was getting over some sort of poison ivy or poison something. And he, uh, so, so he had some, like, he had something going on too, that he had some look like calomel over on top, Benadryl yeah. or something on top of, and I said, you got poison stuff too? Cause I'm just getting, he said, no, I was just trying to talk to him about <laughs> something. I didn't know what to talk to him about. So I was just like, oh, do you have this, the thing that I, you yeah. know. Oh, good. So that was that was the extent of kind of that conversation. But was remarkable about that day, and Mike, and again now I know looking back, you never know what's going on with one individual, why they're in a hurry, what whatever. But Mike just went back straight back to the uh, the dressing rooms. So I didn't interact with Mike. That I saw Mike, but I didn't interact with him. Um, but Bruce, there was this piano sitting there. Bruce eventually comes out. I start talking to him. And I told him, I said, I really like the nearest faraway place from 2020. He goes, really? I got booed off stage in Germany for that. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah. So all of a sudden he goes and sits down at the piano and he starts playing it. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is like. That's wild. So so cool. And then there's a, another fellow there. And all of a sudden we were taking, Bruce was taking requests. All of a sudden. And he was playing. Uh, he I write the songs that make the whole way. He was playing that. And then he went into some other song, maybe Tears in the Morning. It was wild. And, and, but 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 he he got carried away and we got carried away. Who's we, we're not gonna leave. Yeah. Right? We got a we got Bruce Johnston taking requests. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden this this roadie or somebody pops their head in the door and says, Bruce, we're on stage. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> We heard the music. We didn't care. Yeah, we had, we yeah. had the guy sitting here taking requests. We don't care. Oh, that, oh, oh, so he does have to go. Okay. Yeah. Then I suppose we'll go out and sit down. Oh, um, but that was my first backstage experience. Uh, after the show, we got to talk to Al a little bit, but, um, but so that that was actually 94 that my first beach boy show once i started doing esq we started in august of 93 where by, by that time we had the business license i did my interview with dean and the first show we went to was the beach boys did that box set tour mm -hmm. the very first show they did was in charlotte yeah i was at that show that's so cool and man Watching Carl Wilson, well, first of all, watching the song set selection was unbelievable. Vegetables, mm -hmm. wonderful. Take a load off your feet. But watching Carl Wilson go, I I can't quite, I'm going to get it wrong, but I know he went to Wonderful. But whatever song they were doing right before Wonderful, Carl's on guitar, he is singing, he takes his guitar off, and he goes over and he sits down at the keyboard and sings Wonderful and plays and sings wonderful unreal and i and at that moment i was just like okay this this is and and to this day that's like a moment to me that's a moment that mm -hmm. that moment and then lee lucky lee he went to he didn't have to work the next day i did that was a friday i think because i i was in i was working in retail at the time so he went down to atlanta and got to see them do the atlanta show so he got to see the show two days in a row and Bruce Johnston will tell you to this day that he thinks the Atlanta show was the best of all the dates. That's so, cool. so I'm sure it's I'm sure it's been bootlegged though. Yeah. But but that's that the timing of us coming into ESQ and the timing of seeing that show right after we become the the guys who are doing ESQ and to have that that tour begin in Charlotte and to see it uh, was really was really kind of a very like you know Magic. perfect that that's what really that, that was a beautiful moment from from having the timing of lee and i starting esq on the east coast and then ha having that 93 box set concert was just like the perfect kind of one two moment i felt like okay well gosh this is a great time to be doing this yeah it's supposed to start and, now. you know 
Yeah. Yeah. And and the box set had just come out. So it was just, it was perfect for us. We we just really um I'm not sure how Lee felt about it, but you know, I, I just felt like, oh, oh my God, we how how lucky can we be to have just just gotten into this and then get to see this show. And uh so yeah, and and then from really from there, I it took, I guess that was 93. I slowly, Lee, Lee is an incredibly busy person. You know, he works for, he's a, he was a consultant for many years. I think that's still his role, but he works for major companies. So oh. his full-time job is just like, sometimes he's doing million dollar deals. So yeah, so I'm way over my, my pay scale. Oh, <laughs> and uh, so what happens would, would be like, or or because of the company you work for, they'd be having a Christmas party or something. So if we're doing the issue that was around Christmas time, he may miss doing an issue. And it was not lack of interest. It was just, he was interested. He was still single at that time. So he was, he was trying to meet somebody. He was just getting out and about and join life. And I understood it. So I ended up spending more time with the guy who's helping put our magazine together than his name is Greg Russell. And uh, Greg, Greg was a great mentor, a uh, very good friend. He, he, you know, kind of, I would sit next to him and tell him what we wanted in the magazine. And he worked in Cork Express at that time. So I was learning Cork Express. And, wow. um, and so by 99, I think that's right. Um, I, I can't remember how it was decided, but I wanted to do it. I felt comfortable enough that I could do it. Yeah. And 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 it would make it easier be less stress on Greg because we wouldn't be interrupting his life schedule. You know, it was just and again, I it just felt the and it, well, at that time, I think their operative word is control. It's not true anymore, but at the time, I think so. Um, just being, you know, being able to be in control of how the way it layout looks. Um, what the content will, will be, how, where it will go, and how it will go. Um, now I'm thinking about it. Greg, Greg stayed on until I remember him doing the June 2000 cover for the Roxy, cool. and, and doing that issue. So I through 2000 at some point. So, but Lee by September of '99, Lee even wrote a letter into that we included in the magazine where he was officially stepping down from the role of editor and publisher. He, 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 at that time, again, with his life priorities and his job, he, he wanted, he would continue to do back issue fulfillment, which he still does. And oh, wow. he would manage the date, the database, which he still does. Yeah. Um, and that's why people get confused because these, so each of our emails are ESQ. Mine's ESQ editor at Gmail. His is ESQ editor at AOL. So what will happen is I'll get emails for, is my subscription run out? And I just yeah. have to forward it to him because I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if somebody's subscriptions run out <laughs> um, because I just, so, <laughs> and I do have to say as, as much fun as it is uh, piecing together certain parts of the, of the group's history, uh, there's nothing exciting about taking the magazine and putting it in an envelope and sealing the envelope and mailing it. <laughs> it's like folding laundry right there, there is nothing glamorous you get about <laughs> you just it's just another task it's another right. job right. so that element of it um i don't dread it it's just you know it's ta it's it's a bit task task yeah. heavy um but um so that that's kind of it. i felt really fortunate um to this to be a part to kind of come into that world the, the beach boys world when i thought based on just that even that acoustic set tour that they did from the box set that this this was a really interesting time and then you know uh unfortunately um within a handful of years carl was gone yeah right and i remember um Lee telling me, Lee, Lee knew, and I did not know. And he told me. And I remember just, uh, and it's, I think it's still how I feel. I, I just remember being uh, numb. Just numb. He was so young. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm older than that now. No, so, 
I don't, it's hard to uh, wrap my head around it. Yeah. But he was, uh, you know, you heard all these things he, when he passed about, oh, he was the glue. He was the guy who kept them together. And then you see what happens afterwards to the group. Yep. And it's like, okay, he must certainly have been this, 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 and this, because look what happened. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, he was a really, well, I think this is true with all of them. And it's easier to rem remember somebody a certain way. I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of time around Carl. Yeah. Uh, but whenever I was around him, he was very sweet, very genuine, very present. Very present. Um, so cool. You know, I, I've told this story a number of times. They they played um, Fanfare in 96 for their big Stars and Stripes thing. They were, they were in Nashville for like a week doing right. all sorts of emotional work. Right. And Fanfare was like the culmination of that week. And Lee and I were there for that. We were backstage and we just couldn't believe because Brian was there. I mean, we're, wow. we're oh, oh, my God. Alan Boyd's here. Brian, you know, all the Beach Boys are here. <laughs> what, what is going on? Yeah. And there's country artists who we really couldn't care about, could right. care less about, but let's go talk to them because yeah. they're on the album, you know? So that, that was, <laughs> that was amazing. And um, it was, it was that show that afterwards I had my, I had my Pet Sounds album with me and I had already gotten to talk to Carl briefly about the show and about the Stars and Stripes project. It was very brief. It was like, as they came off the stage, he stopped, talked to me briefly. I recorded it, got a picture with him, and then he went off to the trailer. Unreal. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't get the Pet Sounds album signed. I didn't get the Pet Sounds album signed. <laughs> and so I'm like, and you don't know. You never know. You never know what your chance is. You just don't know. So I have my Sharpie ready. I have the album ready. And he comes back out. And we had talked, maybe it, it's maybe been 10 or 15 minutes or so, you know, for long enough for him to go in, towel off or whatever, change his clothes, if that's what he did. And and they're walking to get on a van to go back to wherever they were staying. And he and I and I kind of nervously holding out the album saying, do you mind signing this? And he said, no. Oh. And he, so he signs it and he hands it back to me. And he, and he continues to walk towards the van. He's about 10 feet away from me now. And I say, thank you. You know, I'm saying, and I'm looking at this and I go, thank you, Carl. And he stops completely gigging. I, I swear. He stopped completely, turned all the way around and looked at me and said, thank you, David. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> well, he, that's who he was. And you see that, it's it's I'm I'm glad that I had that moment, but that's who he was. You ask anybody, you know, yeah, regardless of whether how well you knew him, how well right. you knew you, whether you just chance meeting, nice that's guy. who he was. Yeah. And and for him to turn, he could have just said, You're welcome. Let's get Got going. in the van. Right. right. But turned all the way around on his heel, looked right at me and said, Thank you, David. That's not nice. just thank you. But thank you, David, <laughs> to make it a point that he knew who I was. He remembered me and, he, and he, it was important to him to give me that moment. That's unreal. I, and uh, to this day, and, it, and it's a lesson to me. It was one of the first to have that with him was a real lesson to me because that 96 was the same time the Beatles anthology came out. Yeah, right, right, right. And I remember watching that. <laughs> I tell <laughs> This is important for the ESQ story because I watched that and I remember the guy asking all the Beatles, the surviving Beatles, Paul, uh, Ringo, and George, do you, you 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 went over to Elvis's house at one point. Do you remember what color the dress Priscilla was wearing? Right. And I'm thinking to myself, why would you, of all the questions that you could possibly ask the Beatles who were over at Elvis's house, why would you ask them about Priscilla's dress? What does that have to do with anything musical or, or anything, you know, and Paul says, oh, I think it might be, it was purple. And then it comes to Ringo. And then it comes to George and George says, I don't remember the color of a dress. I do remember I was looking for Rifa. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that that was brilliant, that the interviewer probably knew 
because you know you don't get in the position of being the interview without a Beatles anthology without knowing your Beatles history, right? Yeah, Just to be hired to do that. Yeah. So I'm sure the interviewer knew that George was getting high while at Elvis's. But but instead of saying to George, I've read, you know, it's been reported that you were busy, you know, getting stoned when you were at Presley's place. Yeah. Then because what happens if you do that? You're you're then kind of more or less pinning down the subject that you're talking to. Right. Oh, yeah. You're putting them in a you're putting them in a corner, whether it's a good corner or a bad corner or an indifferent, doesn't matter. You're you're you're, you're pinning them to a specific thing. Right. So right. instead he asks about Petrilla's dress, it opens it up. George isn't thinking, well, I don't remember the dress, but I remember I was looking to get high. Yeah. Right. So then you get something that you weren't expecting. And I and as silly as the question was to me, that question and that and that answer, I thought, okay that's the way to interview not necessarily that week of a question but that leave it so that the person can answer uh give them a base question about something but let it so that they can answer and then let their depending on how well they articulate or where their memory is that, that let them take you to that next thing that may give you a question you didn't even know you wanted to ask right so that right from, so from the anthology album onward i started i started asking questions differently right um be, be just from that just from that one example and and i thought that that was because i thought that that was fascinating that you know from from such a mundane question that's an answer like that would come well that's that's something i wanted to ask you about as well kind of leading from that question is like you've been involved with them pretty close for almost 30 years i guess 30 years now you've been writing this magazine for so long and you've written about so many topics with the band and like minute details about the guys and interviewed all these people that have worked with them or spent the weekend with them or met them once in 1987. Like what draws you back to talk about them and write about them so passionately when you're a walking textbook at this point and you know so much about the guys and you know them personally, what keeps you coming back to be like, you know, is it possible to get bored of the Beach Boys? Or do you always find yourself being like, ooh, that's cool. Let me talk about that. Like, where do you stand with that? That kind of now at this point in my life, that kind of comes and goes. Um, what I was touching on with Carl was that when he passed, I was of the presence of mind the same day that I was going to continue working on ESQ even harder than ever to fulfill what I thought because he gave me that moment that I was gonna I was going to whether anybody liked it or not because <laughs> it's just something I decided not Lee me right. I just decided okay I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this going and I'm gonna and I didn't know how many years or anything like that I just thought okay I'm gonna keep this going and I'm gonna I'm gonna give my heart to this yeah they they deserve that uh and that was the, that was the extent of the thought um, it wasn't, and it, you know, and again, at that time when he passed, we didn't see the results of his passing immediately. We right. saw it within the, within the calendar year, but not immediately. Right. And, and so I just, I had talked to the guys enough times by that point, by 98, met them enough, interacted with them enough that I just find them all likable in their own way. Yeah. And so the, 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 specifically now um i do go through things where i'm like what else do i have to write about what else is it that they want that i want to tell what else is it is there you know they're not going to be and i'm not being morbid but they're not going to be here forever um mm -hmm. they're very close my parents are just like a year or two older than they are yeah um so you know i think about those things just because it's just you know, it's it's a natural part of life. And we, we've we seen a lot of uh, musician people already pass away this year. Uh, our people in the Beach Boys umbrella that have passed away this year. Yeah. And um, so it's, I'll give you an example. You held up the recent issue. Um, in the recent magazine, I that article, the Revisiting Brian Wilson's Relationship Music, that took me five years to write. <laughs> Because as I write in the magazine, it's it started with the great release that uh, Mark Lynette, Alan Boyd, and Howie Edelson put together, the Sunshine Tomorrow collection. Yeah. Where we heard extra bits from the Wild Honey 
and Smiley Smile albums. Then the digital releases, and I hope people know about this. If they if they get ESQ, they'll know because I put the QR codes in there for them to go right to it. Yep. Um, the digital releases, Friends, Wake the World, the Friends Sessions, and then 2020, the I Can Hear Music digital, and those are both digital only. But um, I so I wanted to, I knew five, four to five years ago that after those three, the Sunshine Tomorrow, and then those two digital releases came out, that there was something here that I was like hearing just Den Brian's music. I mean, Dennis did a, a lot of stuff, but Brian's music, I thought there's something here just by itself. What was Brian doing? Yeah. And why was he doing it? And then why did he stop? Right? Because that's the, that's like the looming question in Beach Boys lore. Why did Brian Wilson stop? Yeah. Because at, why would you stop if you do pet sounds and then good vibrations? And then why, I mean, Smiley Smell Wild Honey are good enough albums. Mm -hmm. And then Brian loved Friends, whether you, you know, whether anybody watching this loves Friends or not, Brian loved Friends. And, and so in his mind, that was his kind of, his second pet sounds. Right. Right. That, that was him being in the studio again, working with studio musicians, the whole thing. really putting his heart and soul into it. Yeah. 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 Friends was his second pet sounds. Absolutely. And so, why did it stop after that? Was it because, you know, so, and there's all these variables of reasons. And, and so I wanted to just indulge myself with the music only because I already know, like you say, I've been covering it for so long. I know all the various reasons. Right. Right. But I wanted to kind of get to the heart of his music. And so it took me five years. I just made a playlist. I put the songs together. Then I kept rearranging them as I would listen just from doing other work on the computer, just working on something, I would just play it. Yeah. And um, and I keep rearranging them a certain way. And then I and then just like this last December, I that that it came back to me and I said, okay, I'm ready to write about it now. Yeah. I've exactly. listened to it enough. I'm familiar enough with this material that the second I if I just think about the song, even if it's an incomplete song, I know exactly what I'm thinking of. And and I, it's not like I'm I have to go back and listen to it again. Right. So that was one thing I had to familiarize myself. And um, when it's not an actual new Beach Boys release or whatever, you don't listen to it days on end and on and on. And on. So that was the other tricky part was I'm not listening to it all the time. Yeah. So but then I got to the point where it just revealed itself to me. And I don't think the word is exciting, but it's definitely a really I really cherish the moments as, as a writer uh when uh when i know i want to write about something and then it presents itself i love that i mean that that's that's kind of the thing i took away from we'll, we'll talk about this here anyway the 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 article you wrote about brian in this period post smile like you know wild honey friends what i my kind of takeaway after reading it because it was it's such, it's such a well written and thoughtful piece is that like Brian at that point in his life was very spontaneous and impulsive. So like, do you think if he hadn't met Van Dyke Parks and if he maybe continued working with Tony Asher or something, do you think he would have gone as adventurous as something as smile or stay with something kind of in the pet sounds vein and the trajectory of their career would have been completely different if that had been the case. But like, do you think if smile never happened, we would have ever gotten a friend's? It's so hard to say that, that and that's really what made writing that article difficult and why it took me a while to kind of find it. Yeah, was because and that's I think I kind of how I lead off the article is it's so, you know, I wanted to know the music well enough that my subjective perspective of yeah. why, how and when was not such a pivotal part of the article so much as to just look at this material, what was happening in his life. Right. Then he stopped. Why? So that, you know. Van Dyke is an incredible, I mean, just let I mean, my favorite, my favorite Beach Boy song is Cabin Essence. Such a great song. Yeah. So, so that's Brian and Van Dyke. Yeah. So I can't, I, I don't, I don't for a second not want to have the Van Dyke and Brian discussion. Right. But if you look at what Pet Sounds was, and if you look at what Good Vibrations was, and I write in the article that to me, Good Vibrations was a love letter to his mother. Yeah, I thought that was because, because his mother was the one who inspired the entire vi the entire title. Right. So I love the colorful clothes she wears and the way the sunlight plays upon her hair. He's like, look at my mom. Look at my mom. 
Mike is the one who came in with the, I'm picking up good vibration. So even though that works with guy girl, that could also be Audrey is too cool for school, right? I'm picking up good vibrations from her because that's what she's all about. So I think cool. as much as good vibrations is whatever you want to subjectively make it from Brian's personal perspective, it is, it is an echo statement to what his mother represented. That's cool. And, and uh, so again, looking at Brian as a person, right? Because that's what pet sounds is, right? We, you, you listen to pet sounds. What is pet sounds? You take, you take away Tony Asher's lyrics, which would be David Leaf's argument. You take away, right? So it's Brian's music. Well, yep. yes, you could listen to that album and you, you could feel who Brian Wilson was 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. So based on that, going forward, Smile is nothing like, and again, Brian on his own, not with Van Dyke, but Brian is on, on his own during Smile wanted to get into humor. Yeah. Right? That has nothing to do with what he was doing with pet sounds or good right. vibrations. It wasn't that same arc of in the back of my mind or lonely sea or in my room or all this stuff that, that was that was slowly, please let me wonder, that was slowly trickling in and showing us there's this really uh, inverted guy who's creating this majestic beauty for all the world to share. Yeah. But here's, you know, these little samples all the way through his career, then Pet Sounds, then, you know, um, and even on Summer Days, it's the um, the instrumental, and your and your dream comes true. Yeah, for Summer Days. Yeah, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. That's that yeah. one little moment he gave us off that album where he goes, yeah. here I am. <laughs> Here I am. Yeah. If you're wondering, yeah. if anybody's listening, and you're probably not because you just want to hear Sloop John B or, or you know, California Girls or whatever. Yeah, but here I am. Yeah. You know, I'm here. I'm here. And and that's what he kept doing on every Beach Boys album. And then he had Pet Sounds, and then he had Good Vibrations, and and then he had Wonderful too. Okay. And Wonderful is the one. If you listen to all the Smile stuff, Wonderful is that one song like all the early Beach Boys albums that leak through that was Brian mm -hmm. was that was that earnest inverted heartfelt guy that had his heart on his sleeve that was telling the world that he was suffering. Yeah. yeah right. He, he and a lot like him. Yeah. And again, you don't need the lyrics, right? Take the lyrics off. You can feel it. Yep. And you can listen to fire and, and, and feel it. Yeah. You, you, you feel, you feel a, a, a person breaking down. That's what fire is. It's a person breaking down. But again, Smile had nothing to do with Brian, the artist. Brian, yeah. the, 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 the being that needed to show and express himself. Right? So he got off into a different bag. And I think I read it in the, um, like with Van Dyke. Van Dyke was a hipster. Yeah. I, right. He was a hipster. And right. a lot of the people that hung around Van Dyke, the David Crosby's, the Terry Melters, the whoever, all were hipsters. Yeah. Brian was not a hipster. Brian was never a hipster. He hung out oh with God. hipsters. Yep. But just a square is square is hip to be square. So yeah. he was he was as square as you could be. And every all the hipsters wanted to be around him. Right. So it was like he was not a Hollywood dude. He just lived in Hollywood. That's all. <laughs> he was just like an accidental tourist. Yeah. Right. You know, so yeah. there he is, and he's writing this music. He's getting off into the strange stuff, and he and and I didn't write the single word drug in my entire article because right. it's been written elsewhere. But for the sake of this conversation, I will say that that was that's why Smile is all over the place. Yeah, he was into different types of drugs, yeah. you know, and and it would reflect that in what he was working on. And then when you think about it, he, he shelves Smile, and and why? Well, wait, let's just go back to the guy he is. He doesn't, he doesn't know what to do with it. And why is it? Is it because Van Dyke is gone? Partially. Yeah. Is it because he's under too much pressure? Partially. Mm -hmm. Is it the drug use? Partially. But the bottom line is, if you know who Brian Wilson is as a recording artist, and you are in love with Pet Sounds, and you get who he is as a recording artist, that's why. Yeah. That's why. He didn't, he didn't know. He he was like I, I just want to write music that I feel. I I don't I don't this I don't understand. I, I worked and worked and found heroes and villains, and I went to the radio station. The guy wouldn't play it right away. He had to call his boss. What the heck? Yeah. Right. Obviously, right. obviously, this other thing that I'm doing isn't working. Yeah. 
Why did why did I do this? It's not who I am anyway, right? I mean, this I'm I'm guessing this is the type of things that were going through his head. Why why did I do this? This isn't who I am. This isn't like pet sounds. This is not what I'm about. Yeah. I don't know how to finish this. Van Dyke is gone. You know, I what do I do? And so he kept trying to he kept doing his best to kind of try to figure things out, but he ultimately the if you listen to like I said, wonderful. And then you listen to, then he goes, and, and again, Smiley Smiles, its own beast. Very interesting album. I love that album. So, so do I. Yeah. Um, then he gets to Wild Honey and half of the material, over half of the material, 75 to 80% of that album is Brian writing relationship music again. Yeah, right. I'd love just once to see you. Yeah. I, all, oh, honey. You know, all of a sudden, darling. Don't. It's it's all back to love. It's all back to Brian's heart again. It's it's but it, but it's done differently. Now they have a studio in Brian's house. The guys just come over and they jam, and it's it's almost like a live album. It's yeah, unplugged them three years. Just, yeah, yeah. Show up, jam, and and we're and we're done. And it was that contractual agreement thing again. We got to hurry. We got to hurry. Let's just do it. And he ends up getting these a handful of these songs that are again back to relationship. Who he is. What he needs. Right. How he needs to express himself. And then you follow that with friends, which is the exact same thing. And I have that great quote from Marilyn, his first wife in there about that she considers Wild Honey and Friends one big extension. Yeah. That it's just one extension. So See, cool. we the fans, when we go on buy an album, that's all we think about. We Okay, this is the album. These are the songs. We don't think about how many months it's been between this recording session and this recording session all and yeah. what was going on in this person's life that we can examine and, and, and why is this the way that it is? But because these albums are so old, we do get to do that a little bit. Right. And, right. and so that's, what's fortunate about that. But you get into friends, he's relationship music again, meant for you friends, the song friends. Yeah. And then in the Richard, the Richard Mayer interview, in the which is the first feature which I wanted to go first in the brand new issue, he talks about all the photos that they did at the LAX airport. That was great. Richard thought that. Brian was doing that because he thought he wanted that as the Friends cover. That's so cool. I, I mean, who would have and why would he want that? Because the Beach Boys are. <laughs> it makes no sense. But on the other hand, it does make sense because these were Brian's friends. That was just yeah. It, right. It's right, right. So right. was he thinking about a solo album? That's we don't know. We don't know. That's but what we do know, just on the fact that that song was released and knowing that song and knowing that album, mm -hmm. is Brian was once again writing about relationships and that's what he wanted to write about and that's what he represented as a recording artist. That's what it was important to him to express himself through music. And and we any Beach Boy fan can tell you that if they just own the first album. Oh, yeah. By the group. You, the Brian was a recording artist who wanted to express himself through his music. Yeah. And what is one of his great solo career recordings? Love and Mercy. Again, yeah. the guy expressing himself. So I looked at that entire article through that lens of what was Brian trying to do and how was he trying to, you know, what what was he trying to communicate yeah. to the, uh, the music world? And then, you know, the album did pretty well over in the UK. It just did not do well here in the United States when it was yeah. released. So lowest charting at the time. It's funny to kind of, you know, success is success to me. Like if it's successful one place, why not feel good about it? But Brian, you know, and everybody, a lot of Beach Boy fans will say, well, the Beach Boys and Capitol Records had all the pressure on him that he had to provide the next hit. True, but Brian also expected that of himself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he he knew that he had the ability to write another hit. So when he writes a song and takes it to the the, the station with heroes and villains, and the guy won't play it right away, the, whoever was with Brian should have just slapped the guy. I think it was Arnie Geller. You just slap the guy upside the head and say, "Play it already." Do you re you know this is Brian Wilson? You play it, dude. Um, Especially because Good Vibrations was it's insane. It's insane one. to me. It's, it's heroes like, and villains. The guy is coming to right. your studio yeah. to give you the exclusive, and you got to call the boss. Like the follow-up single to the biggest hit they Good ever vibrations. had. Good so, vibrations! I know what is wrong with you. Unbelievable! So anyway, it's just 
It's unbelievable. So then the same thing happens. They release friends and all the DJs, local DJs in, in his area out in Los Angeles and across the United States are just like, what is this? But yeah. What is this? And they're so they're questioning his intention, yeah. not just his expression, but his intention. He's writing a song about togetherness and love and relationships. Peaceful. Yeah. 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 And then being in harmony and 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 being loving and and DJs are saying this isn't any good. What you is Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> yeah. Well, this isn't this isn't the next step above right. good vibrations and heroes and villains. What's yeah. happening here? What's happening? And all he's doing, all he's doing, is going back to that sounds what he's always done. Right? He's just going back to what he knows. He's just yeah. going back to love of music yeah. and expressing himself through it. And so that that really that really got to him. And I'm kind of giving a lot of the article away, but the other thing that really struck me is as is as again Richard Mir talks about this, and I have the great quote from Arnie Geller that I included in there um, about the dad Murray. And, yeah. you know, as Brian becomes a father, with Carney being born in April of 68, as he's becoming a father, adjusting to what fatherhood means, trying to look into, you know, the world of his responsibilities and how he can be a good dad. His own father won't get off the phone with him. His own father is berating him. His own father is manipulating him and says, your songs don't mean crap. Right. And look at what they just said about your song, friends. Look, look. You don't know what you're doing, Brian. You're going downhill. I've been telling you, you've been going downhill for years. I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but that's the rhetoric. Right, right. I, I mean, that that was the general thing. And you need to sell your music. So as Brian is becoming a father and trying to be loving, he has this father figure, literally his own father, who is telling him that he's washed up and that he isn't worth anything. So these are key factors. Now, remarkably, Friends is released. And a, <laughs> a week or two later, Mike and Brian are, boom, do it again, comes out. And they're on the top of the charts again, which yeah. for the Beach Boys as a group is fantastic. He stopped. And the first thing he did in December of 68, December 7th, I think, uh, he went into the studio with the Honeys. His wife, Marilyn, her sister, Diane, and then her cousin, Ginger. And they started working on a couple of songs. Yeah. But that was the first time he went back into the studio. It wasn't Beach Boys. He left 2020 to them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and the 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 thing he gave them for that, um, what's the song that he, he gave them? It wasn't Cabin Essence in Our Prayer because those were leftovers. Time to get a loans on that one. Time to get a loan. And then there was one other. Um, uh we're together again i went to sleep went to sleep yeah those are the two and again now i went to sleep's not a relationship song but it's brian absolutely this is me in my moment this is me in my recorded moment i'm yeah. recording this now this Completely. is me in this moment this is who i am absolutely and that's 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 who he was from the success of pet sounds. Now we all look at pet sounds today. Again, we think, okay, the album, they're feeding animals. That's that's what this is. But pet sounds was much much more than that. You know, Brian hearing Rubber Soul, being inspired, taking from Rubber Soul. Oh, I want to make a collection of songs that is a record, that is a yeah. statement. Right. Um, so those those things were all. But that's how he thought. He wanted to make statements. And it wasn't that he wanted to make pop statements. He didn't want to make hit record statements. He just wanted th he just got to the point in his life by the mid to late 60s where whatever he was writing, if he was going to put his time and energy into it, it was going to be captured in the moment. And it, whether it was busy doing nothing or I went to sleep or I'd love just wants to see you in the nude, it did not matter because that's what he was thinking at the time. Oh, and that's what he was going to give us. Absolutely. That's what he was going to give the world. And he didn't. No one knew if Pet Sons was going to be successful. Right. And and similar, similar to Friends, it was more successful in the UK. Oh, yeah. Than it was here. But it's thanks awesome. to Wouldn't It Be Nice and God Only Knows, it and Sloop John B, it got pumped up the it got bumped up the charts high enough in the US that it was it's crazy to me, right? But if you if you go back and read of that period, everybody kind of considered Pet Sounds 
not a great success in well, the U.S. It was in the, only in the top 10. That was it was number one. So it was well, it wasn't number one. So yeah. this, is, this is let kind of a letdown. Right. Unreal. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> It's not, it's not even close to a letdown. It's it's like the most important album of all time. Yeah. And then just ask Paul McCartney. Yeah. And then and then uh then you know recently they had the poll where not that polls mean anything because we as fans of any music you like what you like. Yeah. But now they called Good Vibrations I think the happiest recording of all time. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yep. Long live Audrey Wilson is what I say to that. <laughs> Long live Audrey Wilson. You know, oh, and I, I got to do that issue um, back in, what is it, February 2021? Yeah. And I did ago. the Audrey Wilson issue. Yeah. And it was Wendy Wilson who talked to me about that. You know, from Wilson Phillips, she said, you know, it was my grandmother. She's the one who said good vibrations. And she, isn't that cool that she, every time I see the word good vibes on something or anywhere I go and I see that phrase, whether yeah. good vibes or good vibrations, I think of my grandmother. That's so cool. I mean, how how relevant is that? And I'm sure she's probably not the first one to utter those words. Yeah. So I just think that's great that uh, Audrey Wilson is just so present in today's society without people even realizing it. That's, I love that. Yeah. You know, if, if the Beach Boys have a real relevant, if, if Good Vibrations is the number one song of all time that makes people happy, that's a nice legacy for Audrey Wilson. Her, her memory forever on that one. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they executed it, right? They wrote it. It's her boys who wrote it. Yeah, and and, and her her ne nephew, right? Yeah, and yeah, Audrey, right. yeah, and her nephew. I mean, that's it's it's pretty. Uh, for all the accolades they've received for that song, you know, she's she's got to be. I she's guess got to be smiling. That's all, that's so cool. Got to be. Um. One of the things I wanted to ask you about the magazine itself is I know that for people watching this now are going to be very interested in, in looking at back issues from the 30 years that this magazine has been around. Um, off the top of your head, do you know some of the older issues that still exist? Because I've got some from the 90s that I've ordered online. Do some 90s issues still exist? That varies. Um, the ones that we did prior to digital um, – We've kind of let go. Not yeah. that we wouldn't redo them ever again, um, but the uh, the type of content that are in some of those older issues isn't as strong as the type of content that we put together through the years. Sure. So that's kind of another reason. Do we want to go through that process of taking out the flats, having the flats? And we did that a number of times um, because we just take the flats into the printer and they do the copying and it, it can be certainly done. Yeah. Um, I don't, what I've asked Lee to do, because we've talked about this in the last few years, I've said, let's just let um, certain, you know, magazine editions go. Let's yeah. not worry about it. Because if one's over, let's say, like, example, there was, we did kind of a summer, we did a Sunflower edition for the summer 2010 issue of ESQ. Yeah. Where I, where I interviewed Al and uh, Fred Vail. And then we came up on summer 10 years later, summer 2020, and I did a full fledged sunflower edition where I talked to all the guys. Yeah. And I said, what's the point of having the old one? True. I didn't see it. So I just said, let it be sold out. Yeah. The other ones that come up with CDs, if once we sell out of those, we sell out of them because yeah. there's only, it doesn't make sense to sell the magazine if it doesn't have the CD with it Absolutely. because a large part of the, of what you were getting was the CD. Right. Uh, well, that's that's true with the Brian collectible smile ones because that's the only place on earth that you can get them. It's so cool. Um, yeah. Why there are some, I mean, if there's some that people go to the site, they see something, it's sold out, um, and they want it, they can just collect, you know, contact Lee at ESQ editor at AOL.com and ask. And um, I'm going through the website. I, would, I have been going through the website and looking at uh, editions that are sold out and I'm working on a couple now. What happens was one, they were built, some of them were built in Quark Express. Mm. So I have to open them up in InDesign. So I have a converter software for that. I open them up in, um, in InDesign. And then there's also a lot, back then I would paginate it. So on my screen, it's page 
two, three, four, five, six, and then the opposite. So nowadays I don't have to do that. Right. It's just right, read, left. It's two, three, four, five, six. Seven. So it's not paginated and uh, it's much easier these days. But oh, yeah. um, a lot of times when I open these old editions, it takes me a couple of weeks to get it newly formatted, um, make sure there's no text jumps that where text is missing because mm -hmm. The fonts are slightly different now yeah. because they're older yeah. fonts. They they jump around. You have to make sure that you're replacing the correct font in the right way. You have to make sure there may be a better picture that's happened in, over the last 15 years or something since something is sold out. Right. Um, right. But and and I may want I may want to just do a different cover for shits and giggles. Yeah. Because it's Why just not? you know yeah. the old the old cover doesn't look very good. Right. Right. Um, right. So that's that's another thing. Uh, and I've done that a couple of times, but. Um, Right now I'm working on the, uh, because there's so much interest in Brian and his music, um, the winter 2018 edition, which is a 30th anniversary to his 88 album. Oh yeah, I've got that uh, one. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that sold out. I'm working on that. Oh, cool. And the winter, oh, there's another one. Oh, the one I did with Brian and Andy Paley's music. Mm, yep. So that, that also sold out. So I'm working on that stuff. I have those in InDesign, but I have to then, I, like I said, I have to format. Um, everything just moves around inconspicuously, and uh, it's a lot to pay attention to. Yeah. If I just send it to the printer right now, nobody would be happy <laughs> because be like, what, what's going on here? What's, yeah. what's half the page is missing? What's, what's up? <laughs> so I can't just pull them up and send them, unfortunately. I, I had to explain that to Lee. I said, Lee, it's not that simple. Right. Um, I wish it were, well, but, yeah. um, but that's, you know, we, uh, we're coming up on our, th August will mark the 30th anniversary that I've been doing the magazine. I've been encouraged to do like a, you know, best of 30 years type of thing, but, um, really what I want to do next, we were taught when we started talking, we were talking about what inspires, what, you know, what, after all these years, what, you know, what what do you still want to do? And one of the albums, because it's, I mentioned it's my favorite is the 85 album. So I'm digging into that. I got a great interview with Steve Levine. Oh, cool. That I've been holding on to for over a year because again, just trying to figure out when to put something to get it out. I try to time it with the anniversary of, so if it, because right. it came out in 85, I'm trying to get it with a, 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 a five year, a 50 year, a 45 year, whatever it is, 35 year, and then that mark passed. And then unfortunately we lost Billy Henshi. So people are passing away. You kind of have to reroute what you're doing because you, you know, I wanted to get Billy's edition out last summer, but I didn't have what I wanted to do it. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing I have, like I've had Steve's interview for a while, but I don't have everything I want to put that out. And then oddly enough, since 2019, I've been working with Ron Outback. Wow. And last year he sent me albums and some, uh, an unreleased documentary, um, all this sorts of stuff that he did with celebration with Mike and Charles Lloyd and albums that they did for those in that, in that frame of time frame, And it was fascinating. He and I were working on it and working on it and working on it. And I left a voicemail for him 30 minutes before I found out he passed away. Oh my gosh. Because yeah. so I, I just got done transcribing all three of our interviews like the weekend before he passed. And I was saying, Hey, let, I want to kind of go over this with you. I got some follow-up questions. I was texting him. Didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, I knew that he'd been in Europe and that he had come back. Um, but he's a very busy guy. He's always he was always, you know, into something. <laughs> and uh, and uh, but the nice thing was, it's in our interview, we we agree in the interview that when when we're talking, that I say to him, you know, getting you on the phone. The I, my initial idea was to do MIU, but after looking at everything you've sent me and all that. I think this needs to be a, a discussion about you, Mike, and Charles, and a celebration discussion. That's and awesome. he said, "Yeah, that's that's what I want to do." That's so cool. So, so that I've never had, never been working on something 
and had someone pass away that I've been working with while I'm doing it. It's sad. Yeah. So it is, but I'm, I think similarly to when Carl passed, mm -hmm. I feel very uh, secure in saying that I'm going to do Ron's wishes justice. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. I can promise, you know, even, I, and it's my hope that because that's not a great, for most Beach Boy fans, that's not like a big deal period per se. But there's going to be a lot of history that that we'll be uncovering that's just not out there. Or if it's out there in one form or another, it will make more sense now. Right. As to what it represents and why it's there. Yeah. So um, that will come out you. this year. I don't I don't know when, though, I, I because I have to now. Like I talked to Al Tuesday. Um, now it's not just Al. I want to talk about this time frame. But I also now want to talk to you about Ron. Yeah. Because he's passed yeah, away. So, yeah. so it's, it's it's kind of this two different things now. So I'm still doing what Ron and I set our, you know, our insights and ambitions on. But I'm also yeah. now making kind of a, a memoriam. Yeah. It's it, But it's kind of a, like a living memoriam. It's different. It's different. It's so I, recent. I yeah. Because he was a part of it. Yeah, it's, right. He has everything, it's his hands in it. You know, it's something that's, you know, it'd be one thing if I wanted to do it and I don't, and, and he wasn't actively sending me things and a part of it and involved. Sure. That would be different, but sure. it's it's different when somebody's invested and they're giving their your time and energy, not just doing interviews, but interacting with you and sending you stuff so that you have everything that you need and that together you're telling that story, right? You're connect. You're connecting all the different pieces. So it may, you know, what a guy. So Man. really it's and it's a fast for me, it's telling the celebration story and why and how. Especially after talking to Al. Um yeah. it's it's just a lot of answers will be question a lot of questions will be answered about the MIU period. That's that, so exciting. People want so that. that. It's, that's gonna be a great issue when it comes out. Um, well, I hope, yeah, I hope that one will come out this year. That's so cool. But that's but that's to speak to like what what inspires me. Am I always inspiring? Am I how do I do it after all these years? I'm not always. Um, I was not excited about the when I heard about the tribute and I saw the lineup for the Grammy tribute. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm glad they were all there together to see yeah. it. Um, they didn't go down and perform anything themselves, which no. is like. So like maybe like for an encore that they'd be down there with everybody on stage or something and they didn't do that. And then none of those acts to me, to me, not that they're not good acts or anything. I don't make a connection between, I mean, the Doobie brothers once upon a time opened for the beach boys mm -hmm. and Michael McDonald was a beat Doobie brother. Yeah. So there's that, but there's not any other connective tissue between any of the groups and the Beach Boys themselves, regardless of whether they did a good rendition of any various song. There's not, it's I don't see the connection between Weezer and the Beach Boys or anybody else. It's just not. Oh, well, they're huge Beach Boys well, fans. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's just, I don't, you know, and I, I it seemed to me just from what I've read online, it just seems that's the general consensus. Is it's just like, you know, I think fans' expectations for a 60th anniversary were, were more. Mine were. Um, I, I don't know what that. I wanted. Something. Something I mean, more than what we've gotten. The only thing I would have wanted, which is to have all of them around a piano, Brian at the piano, they could sing one song together. That would have been perfect for me. Just put it, put a ribbon on it, tie it off, we're done. Like, we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could have been any song whatsoever. Yeah. You know, and I, I never... Perfect. I never would have dreamt that the, you know, the California music project that I did last year would be the closest thing that we would get to a new, I, I thought for sure they would figure something out that. Yeah. Absolutely. That there'd be. Plug. <laughs> plug. Um, so, you know, I didn't, uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by it. You know, I am and I'm not, you know, they're, 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 they're like anyone their age, regardless of what they do in life, 
they're entitled to do what makes them comfortable. Right. Right. So that is it. That is it. They owe us nothing at this point. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, they Oh my gosh. Well, I'll ask you one last question. Um, having done the magazine for so long, what do you feel is the legacy of Endless Summer Quarterly? And like, where do you stand in terms of like, how we even word this? Obviously, you're proud of the work you've done for the magazine and for the fans. And you've created this body of work that will last forever because people can read about the, the guys contextually to the point in time something was happening. When you look back on it, What's it mean to you? Um, I think the most meaningful parts of, of being the editor and publisher of Endless Summer Quarterly is when I know that I did something good that helped remind the surviving members who are with us today that um, that history would dictate otherwise um, or, or even even if they're both still alive today, in some cases, where I remind them uh, in an in, just in a discussion interview, could be backstage, could be an actual interview, where I'll remind them of the value of their of their of their bandmates. Um, one example that comes to mind, and Mike actually talked about this in his book, so I wasn't any you know I didn't I didn't uncover new ground, but I got yeah. it in I got it in print in ESQ, which was special was when the Beach Boys played the UNICEF concert in December of 67. Yeah. In the front row was John Lennon, George Harrison with Maharishi um, sitting between them. After the show, they all met him. And then all the group, except for Dennis, I think this is true, all the group went off to London to get into some parties and hang out and do non-related non-related activities right. not, not music related activities now dennis the one that you would think would be doing that actually stayed back in paris and maharishi said to him i would like to give you all mantras and teach you transcendental meditation right so dennis is then the one who calls all the beach boys in london and says you have to come back yeah right so i'm interviewing mike about the friends album and one of the things that I mentioned to him, I said, Mike, it's unique that the Friends album is actually the length of a meditation. And he said, it is. I said, it is. And I said, the first song is called Meant for You. And it says, as I sit and close my eyes and there's peace in my mind, isn't that how you begin a meditation? He says, it is. <laughs> and he said, that's just a coincidence. He said, I never even thought about that. So that was cool. Yeah. But the meaningful thing I said to him, I said, so Mike, you learn TM. With, with Maharishi giving you your mantras, you all go back to Los Angeles, you finish your four day course with, the, with a teacher who's in Los Angeles, but you learn from Maharishi, the guy. You then go to Rishikesh, India, because he invited you to go. You end up on a teacher training course by accident. You didn't even know it was. Yeah. You, you end up, TM is like a part of your life from that point onward. Isn't it, is it, is it okay to say, I'm paraphrasing, but is it, is it possible that that phone call that you got from Dennis is possibly one of the most important phone calls of your entire life? Jeez. For which Mike said, yes. That's heavy. That's, that's a moment that I'm, that brings me great satisfaction yeah. to remind Mike of how valuable Dennis was to him. Yeah. Absolutely. That so that's, and that's true. Yeah. It's true. Mike is a, to this day, you want to talk about PM? He's right there. He'll be the first, oh, yeah. he'll, first in line, Mr. Positivity. <laughs> right there. And, uh, and, and more power to him. He, I, and I can't, I can't say he's wrong because I practice. Absolutely. So, so um, you know, um, so I guess in some weird roundabout way, I have Dennis to thank. Yeah, because for him, if Mike doesn't if Mike doesn't return from London and, and do that, then what happens? Then who knows? Another different yeah. course. I mean, that's yeah. that's one of the cool things about this band is that there are so many what ifs. It's a it's a what if story with the Beach Boys over and over and over again. Um, and the other thing, and there's other occasions where I've reminded Mike and Al, who you know they haven't toured really together, um, but I will remind them when I talk to them. If I'm talking to one or the other, and if the if the other 
person comes up, I'll just remind them in conversation. Yeah, you know, it's it's cool that you and and Mike have that in common. Is how I talk to them. It's neat. It's interesting to me that you guys have that in common. Right. So that's what I do with them. That's what, and maybe that's what they like about me. I, I really don't know, but I I like I like reminding them of the good stuff. I like reminding them of why being in the music business and the word business is awful, yeah. but being in music and the value and the meaning it's had in their lives, that's, I think, my most important, le- I don't know anything about a legacy, but if, if if I've done anything right, I would say it's that, that that they know when, the, when, when they talk to me that I'm, I care about, I'm sensitive to all of them. Yeah. And I've literally told, I've literally told all of them I love them. Yeah. So if any of them are uncomfortable with that, they have to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> because they all know. Yeah. That's <laughs> I don't funny. think they're used to I don't think they're used to hearing it though. But they've they've gotten to a point now where I think they're used to hearing it from me. They've accepted a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just true. Yeah. I mean, I you know, first of all, I'm so lucky that I have, you know, the ability to to have known them and to spend time with them. And I don't know know them. You know, that right. right. That's another kind of thing I you know you know when I was going through my divorce um I ended up getting on the phone with Dean one day I just called him out of the blue he said where have you been and we got talking and I told him what I was going through in my life and then all of a sudden he started sharing personal stuff with me about troubles he had gone through struggles he had gone through and right as we're about to hang up he says to me I'm honored that you shared this with me Oof. And I realized in that moment that Dean was my friend. Yeah. But I never, I never did ESQ, never, never has been, I want to be their buddy. Right. It's, it's, I want to write about this music because this music inspires me. These, you know, they made, you know, um, they made such an impact on my life. So I want to give it back. Right. I want to give it back. So that's right. that's what ESQ represents. If, so if, I guess a legacy word would be try to give it back. I you know I try to give back so that the fans get something out of it because the fans it. readers don't all get to go back and do the you know spend time with them like I do. I don't want them to feel like I'm paying some I'm paying money for something. I'm getting a magazine and this is just writing about his own experiences backstage. That that's a drag. No, that, something like that. that no. Yeah, so, that nobody. So I try to bring the reader in. Yeah. I try to. I I, I want to make the reader a part of the experience. Yeah. Um, and I do that. That's another thing that I really try to do. So those things, you know, trying to make the Beach Boys remind the Beach Boys who are still here uh, of their value and how important they are to the world um, and how their music is really kind of it, it administers good things to people so it, it's in a ministry it's almost a music ministry unto itself yeah and then and then uh trying to bring the reader in making the reader a part of the experience trying to give the reader the backstage pass right those are the those are the things i love it well david thank you so much for this doing this interview here this has been so much fun to chat and learn about the magazine about your story um for everybody watching this, the links are below to go to the website, to do a subscription, to look for the back issues. Um, and David, thank you so much for being here. This has been great. Oh, I really enjoyed it too. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, man.